If we could have saved ourselves, Jesus wouldn't have needed to come. Charleston, that's absolutely right, and that is exactly what I've been trying to say all evening. And also, if, if people had been able to save themselves, then, you know, I think sometimes we read the Old Testament as if that's how Old Testament characters got saved. Right? But Jesus needed to come to save everybody who got saved all the way through the Old Testament and all the way into the New. Yeah. In your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 12. I'm going to read just two passages to us from the book of Genesis about Abraham, because we're going to come and think about him in a little bit of time as we think about justification. So I'm going to read to you uh, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 9. And then chapter 15, so Genesis 12, 1 to 9. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife, Sarai, his nephew, Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan and they arrived there. Abram travelled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem, the time the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. And there he went onwards to the hills of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued towards the Negev. Turn over a page to chapter 15. So you might know the story in between that Abram and Lot separate. Lot takes what he thinks is the best land. And then Abram has to rescue him as Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed. Then chapter 15, after this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Sorry, Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed in chapter 19. He goes to Sodom in chapter 14. I got a bit confused. Chapter 15, verse 1. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus. Abram said, You have given me no children. So a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord. He brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I shall gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer and a goat and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and ill-treated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterwards they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, 
a smoking brazier with a brazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham and said to your descendants, I give this land from the Wadi of Egypt, to the great river of Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenites, the Kadamites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Raphites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. There you go. Well, we'll be thinking a bit more about Abraham in a bit. Let me pray for us as we look at God's word. Let's pray. Father, we ask now, just as we come and quiet our hearts to look at your word, we pray that you might help us. Father, we're conscious that our great weakness is not that we miss out words on the screen, but that we are slow of heart to love you and trust you as we should. We're slow to think your thoughts. We're slow to follow your ways. We're quick to think of other things and not you. Please, we pray, bear with us this evening. Be patient with us. Be at work in us by your spirit. Be gracious to us, we ask. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I have a handout for you. And uh, so if you want to take one, and um, are you going to give them out for me? You can give them out? Great. Thank you. So what we've been doing over the, well, what we did last week and what we're doing this week and Lord willing, in a couple of weeks' time as well, is looking at some of what the Bible teaches about what is happening as Jesus dies on the cross. Girls, are you nearly done with these pens? <laughs> it's like the hardest thing ever. They're hard to get out, are they? We should just take them out of the bag, should we? So why did Jesus have to die on the cross? We were thinking about that last week. What is it that Jesus is achieving as he dies on the cross? And last week we looked at propitiation. The idea that on the cross, Jesus was bearing God's wrath at our sin, and thereby fulfilling the Old Testament images by becoming what they were pointing to. Now, before we go uh, any further, I want to start by saying that propitiation, this idea that Jesus bears the wrath of God on the cross for our sin, is right at the heart of everything else that's going on in the gospel. In other words, uh, the other things that we're looking uh, at over these coming weeks, sort of flow from propitiation. Um, Jim Packer, in his uh, famous book, Knowing God, if you've never read a Christian book or never listened to an audio version of a Christian book, start with Knowing God. It's a great book. It's a dense book, but it is a really good book. He says this about propitiation. When you stand on the top of Snowdon, you see the whole of Snowdonia spread out around you. You have a wider view than you get from any other point in the area. Similarly, when you're on top of the truth of propitiation, you can see the entire Bible in perspective, and you are in a position to take measure of vital matters which cannot be properly grasped on any other terms. So there's his point. Propitiation, if we get that, that Jesus bears the wrath of God for our sins, on the cross in our place we have stood on the top of the mountain and we can see everything else that's going on and so it's with that in mind that i want us this week to think about not so much what's happening to god on the cross but what's happening to us as a result of jesus death on the cross and i want us to think about at that phrase that christians use which is justification by faith what is justification by faith what is justification now just to start very briefly with a definition justification is a legal declaration if you're hearing the languages of justification you are in the law courts right but it's not just a definition it's not just a, a declaration that someone is not guilty for a crime but it's also the declaration that that person is perfectly in the right if you are justified it's not only that you've not done anything wrong it's that you have done what is right we perhaps lose it a little bit in the English, but in Greek and in Latin, the words justified and righteous are the same. So to be declared justified is the same as being declared righteous or right. So that to be justified is to be declared righteous in the right. You may have heard that definition. Justification is just as if I'd never sinned. Have you heard that? Justification is just as if I'd never sinned. Now that is right. If you understand that by never sinning, you have done what is perfectly right. Do you get what I mean? 
really justification is just as if I'd done everything perfectly right, but of course that doesn't really fit the word. So it's not just as if I'd never sinned, it's just as if I'd done everything right. And the Bible's extraordinary claim, which we're going to consider together this evening, is that because of Christ's propitiatory death on the cross, his, his death bearing God's wrath, from the moment of conversion, the Christian is justified in the sight of God. They are declared righteous. And that's what I want us to consider together this evening. And I've got five quick headings. What is justification by faith? Who is it for? How can it be mine? Why is it important? And why it is the key to joy? So let's start. What is justification? And I want you to turn to Romans chapter 4. And I'm going to read to you Romans chapter 4 about Abraham. Romans chapter 4 verses 1 to 12. It's page 1131 if you've got a Bible from the church. Romans chapter 4. What shall we say then that Abraham our forefather according to the flesh discovered in this matter? If in fact Abraham was justified, declared righteous by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, which is from Genesis 15. Now, to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, the one who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. Is this blessedness only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We've been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before. And he received circumcision as a sign, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then he is the father of all who believe but have not been circumcised in order that righteousness might be credited to them. And he is also the father of the circumcised who not only are circumcised, but who also follow in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. Now, zoom in on verse five. And I think in verse five, Romans chapter four, verse five, you have one of the best, clearest, shortest definitions of justification by faith in the Bible. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. This is justification by faith. God the Father crediting righteousness to the ungodly. The word credit is all the way through the passage, but it's not actually Paul's word, is it? It's picked up, as we saw in Genesis, from Genesis 15. It's a quote, isn't it? Verse 3 from Genesis 15, where Abraham, having believed God that he would keep his promise to him, is credited as being righteous on account of his faith, his trust in the Lord. Paul defines credited in verse 4 by contrasting it to wages. Notice what he says, to the one who works, wages are not credited, but a gift, sorry, credited as a gift, but as an obligation. You know, at the end of the month, your employer does not come to you and say, hey, listen, out of the kindness of my heart, here are your wages for the month. No, it's not out of the kindness of their heart. They are obliged to pay your wages for your work. But at Christmas, when someone gives you a gift, they, they credit it to you, they gift it to you, don't they? Not on account of the work that you've done, or on account of their love for you. And that's what's going on here, isn't it? Uh, Abraham is not earning, he's not getting paid in righteousness. He is instead being credited. He is being regarded as righteous. It is being reckoned to his account. God has decided to, to consider Abraham in a certain way. Interesting, the, the root of the word credit or count, I think it is in some translations, is the verb to say or to tell. In, in effect, God is is saying something about Abraham. He is saying that he is righteous, something that he has not earned and does not deserve, but is true because God declares it to be true. 
So God is declaring that Abraham is righteous, even though when God says it, Abraham is not in himself righteous. Now, Abraham is a pagan, but as Abraham believes God, verse 3, it is by God that he is credited as righteous. Now, if you're still scanning with me this evening, which you might not be, but if you are still scanning with me, you should be thinking, Steve, this is scandalous. How can, how can God declare, credit Abraham with righteousness, declare him to be someone who has not done anything wrong, whilst at the same time he is a pagan? He is in the wrong. You know, how can God say that something wrong is right? That's wrong-headed, isn't it? It's upside down. Now, if that's what you're thinking, then I think you're beginning to understand justification by faith, because that's exactly what's going on. And it is scandalous. It is scandalously brilliant that God, without for a moment contradicting his holy goodness or truthfulness, can count or credit sinners as righteous is our only hope. So how can, how can God do that? Well, that's what we were thinking about last week, isn't it? Justification by faith works because it's built on the foundation of Christ's death in our place, bearing God's judgment for our sin. So God can credit sinners as righteous, not because he's ceased to be true, but because Christ has paid the penalty for their sin. And in his great love, he is willing to count that to our credit. Okay, so that is the first point. What, uh, who is justification by faith for? What is justification? Who is justification by faith for? Now, this is really crucial, and I think this is the bit that we don't often get clear or always get clear. So listen up. Look again at verse 5 and see what the prerequisite is or the qualification for being justified. Well, it's faith, yes, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. But alongside that, notice verse 5. It's he who justifies the ungodly. Do you see that? However, the one who does not work but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly. Now, this is going to just fry our circuits for a moment. What, what do you have to be to be a suitable recipient of God's declaration of justification? What do you have to be? Ungodly. That's what you have to be. Ungodly. Now, if you happen to be from a, a Roman Catholic background, then this is really going to be useful to you because Romans chapter 4 verse 5 causes havoc for Roman Catholic doctrine. The official position of the Roman Catholic Church is that at the heart of our salvation is God graciously infusing righteousness to sinners. In other words, not so much declaring them to be righteous while they, they are ungodly, but making them godly by this righteous infusion and then declaring them righteous as the infusion takes effect. I think on your handout I put a little diagram of what that might look like as if righteousness is sort of being poured in to the Christian and as God sees that righteousness being poured in he then says ah yes they are righteous they are righteous but you need to be super clear that that's not what Romans chapter 4 verse 5 is telling you it is not what the Bible teaches about justification so taking the example of Abraham in verses 9 to 10, when did God count him as righteous, Paul asks, was it before or after he was circumcised? In other words, was he de declared to be fully saved and eternally secure in the right with God before or after his act of obedience? And the answer is, it's before, isn't it? Abraham is declared to be fully in the right with God before any kind of righteousness has been infused into him, but whilst at the same time he was still uncircumcised and ungodly. Now, lots of us get in a muddle here, and I, you know, I am also as easily confused as anybody else, right? So I don't want you to feel bad for being confused. But if we miss this, we are robbed of assurance. And, and we tend just to be driven by guilt, don't we? But the truth is that God doesn't infuse righteousness to sinners to make them deserve his salvation. Rather, he counts or imputes righteousness to sinners while they're still ungodly. So that right now, okay, right in this moment, right now, with all that you know that you've done wrong, all of its ugly detail, you know, your broken thoughts, your wicked desires, my broken thoughts, my wicked desires, my hurtful actions, my unkind, selfish impulses, my self-pity, 
With, with all of those, at the same time, God can declare me to be absolutely righteous in Jesus Christ. I am righteous before God for the sole reason that he has chosen in Christ to declare that to be true of me, even while at the same time I'm struggling and battling with my sin. It's interesting, isn't it? I don't know whether I really understand why churches are full of people who pretend to be better than they really are. You notice that about churches. Churches are full of people who pretend to be better than they really are. But what is the qualification for righteousness, justification by faith? What's the qualification in the passage? Ungodliness, right? So if you're pretending to be better than you really are, you're pretending that you're in less need of God's saving grace. What a, what a stupid thing to pretend at church. Actually, church exists for ungodly people who have been declared righteous by an action of Christ on the cross. Yeah, thanks, Guy. Praise the Lord. Now, and I know a number of us, at any time in church, we, we struggle, don't we, to, to, to think about our salvation. Am I really a Christian? Am I really saved? Has God really saved me? Christian people are so good, aren't they? And I'm not like that. And then you just need to ask yourself, well, am I ungodly? Yes, I am. Well, welcome. Welcome. Because justification by faith is for the ungodly. And when as a Christian you sin, you don't wonder, do you, when you sin, you don't think, oh, am I now too bad for God? Will he, will he be able to save me from this? You know, in, one, in one sense, when we bring our sin to God, you know, we, we're surprised, aren't we, by what we're still capable of doing. And so we bring, we bring our sin to God and we're, we're like, oh, you know, are you still going to love me even though I do this? And I just, well, I, I've known all, God's not surprised, is he? I've known all along. I've known all along. And I have declared you righteous in Jesus Christ. I have done everything that needed to be done to save you. And so when I sin, it's not so much that I take it to God and say, you know, will you still love me? It's more I go, oh, even this is covered by your righteousness. Even this, even this was what Christ died for. Even the penalty for this sin has been paid. Thank you, Jesus. Thirdly, how can justification by faith be mine? Look down at verse five. Now to the one who works, sorry, that's verse four, to the one who works, his wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, verse five, to the one who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. So how can justification by faith be mine? Answer, by belief or <coughs> trust in God who justifies. Now, obviously this belief here is the same as the faith that we've been talking about this morning, the empty hand, that receives the gift, the gift of righteousness rather than the payment of works, as it's put in verse four. But here that faith is spelt out, isn't it? As belief or trust, trust in him who justifies. Now, I've tried to be clear on the error of the Roman Catholic Church on justification by faith, but let me try and bring this maybe a little bit closer to home. And I think there's a challenge here for evangelical churches who love to talk about the doctrine of justification by faith. They love the atonement. We love talking about the cross. We love talking about forgiveness and grace all the time. And that's great. But I want us to notice something really simple in verse five, which is this. It is not belief in justification by faith that saves you. It's belief in the God who justifies by faith that saves you. In other words, salvation is not belief in the means of salvation so much as it is in the beauty of the one who saves think about the example of abraham abraham is the father of no one living in a tent with an aging but beautiful wife they have no children and despite receiving the covenant promises he and he's uprooted his family to move to where god has told him still it doesn't seem as if god is going to keep his promises what at that point does Abraham do? Well, he doesn't get excited by the means by which God will keep the promise. Instead, as he looks and sees the stars in the sky and hears the promise of God, he gets excited by the God who is promising him all of these things. This God loves me and is promising these things to me. And so he loves him and trusts him. He believes the Lord in Genesis 15, 16, and it is counted to him as righteousness. 
This is super helpful, isn't it? Because it's possible to forget that justification by faith is meant to point to us, sorry, point us to the loving wonder of God the Father and his agent, Jesus Christ. And if, if we forget that, our Christian lives become a sort of transaction thing, don't they? You know, like being a Christian is like a forgiveness cash point where you just come every week to kind of draw some more forgiveness cash out that you need. But it's not that, is it? Actually, the Christian life is a relationship with the Lord who made us by the means of the gospel of grace. And it's him that we trust and it's him that we come to. I'm gonna skip over my illustration about a crashed car because I don't think you need to hear my illustration about a crashed car. The beauty and wonder of, you wanna hear this illustration? You want, Lola wants to hear the illustration. Um, I th think this is a this is a change on an illustration that I uh, have used before. But anyway, uh, imagine that you you borrow your dad's car and you crash it. Okay, maybe that's not such a difficult thing to imagine because maybe some of you have crashed your dad's car at some point. Yeah, yes. Okay. Now you crash your dad's car and and you bring it back the, the tangled mess of metal and an expensive bill. And your, your dad, what does he do? He takes on an extra job, sacrifices his own time and energy. He works late nights and early mornings in order to repair the car that you smashed up and get it back on the road. Now, you know, perhaps you, as you look at that, you think that the way you da your dad did that, that's really neat, you know. It's, it's neat the way that he managed to fit all the time together in order to take that extra job and you reflect on that and the cost to him. But actually, it's not the beauty of the extra job that you're attracted to. It's your dad's love, isn't it? That you see in what he has done. So the, the beauty of the cross of Christ is the, is the beauty of the Lord that it shows to us, isn't it? God loves me like that. He would do that for me. It's him that I am drawn to as the cross shows me his beauty. Justification by faith teaches us that God's love for us in Christ is sufficient for all our sin. It cost him uh, Christ's death on the cross. It finds its source in him and not us. Our salvation rests on the unchanging, immovable, irresistible love of God for ungodly sinners. Shows us that Christ is beautiful and lovely and worthy of our faith. You know, just imagine such love. Such love that cannot be explained by the loveliness of us, but only by the love of God itself, himself. So next, fourthly, why is justification by faith important? I think sometimes people jump over Romans chapter four. We like Romans chapter three. We were looking at that a bit last week. And then Romans chapter five gets this great stuff about at just the right time Christ died for us. And we jump over chapter four, but there's something really brilliant about chapter four. And it is this, justification by faith is important because justification by faith is the only way that God has ever saved anybody, right? Romans 4 is there to show to you that Abraham and David were regenerate believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, yeah? Because they are justified by faith in the promise that's fulfilled in Jesus Christ. You know, they're not time travelers and they don't know all the ins and outs of the gospel story, but God has only ever saved by faith in Christ, either Christ as revealed in the gospel accounts or Christ promised in the Old Testament covenants. And so Paul shows this to his Jewish audience in Rome and he says, hey, this great hero of yours, Abraham and his sidekick, David, Abraham, the, the great uh, inheritor of the covenant promises and David with the Davidic promise of a kingdom, they are both believers in Jesus Christ and recipients of justification by faith. And justification by faith is important because it's always what God has been saying. And it's always how God has been saving. And its fulfillment in the work of Christ is what God has always been working towards. Imagine for a moment that Arsenal win the Premier League this season because of Liverpool's slight fumble this afternoon, right? What's Arteta going to say when he, he gets to the, you know, hold the Premier League trophy? He's going to say, we've been working hard all year for this. You know, this, is, this has been our goal for several years and we've been building up to it. And in a sense, that's what's going on in the book of Romans. Paul is saying, listen, this isn't just like pulling this out of the bag at the last minute. I, 
the Lord has been working towards the culmination in Jesus Christ for generations upon generations upon generations. What God has been doing has always been pointing to justification by faith through Christ's death on the cross. It's the center of how God saves. It's right in the center of history. You know, Martin Luther, the great reformer, did not invent justification by faith because Abraham experienced it as he believed in the Lord. Finally, why justification by faith is the key to joy. Now, this is going to be like a, a, a prelude to what we're going to be looking at in a few weeks' time. Maybe you noticed in verses 6 to 8, I don't think you probably did, but maybe you noticed in verses 6 and 8, the, the word blessedness gets repeated, doesn't it? it David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. David is saying in Psalm 32 that it is a blessing to be a free recipient of justification by faith. The word blessing means happy or, jo or joyful. This is the thing that we all want, isn't it? Everybody in the world wants to be happy. It's why the materialist buys stuff, because they believe buying stuff will make them happy, or why the workaholic works so hard, because they believe somewhere deep in their heart, either the work itself or the money and the security that will come from it will make them happy. It's why the religious person goes to church or the temple, why they pray or fast, because they believe that God will then give them the happiness in life that they are asking for all the time. But David says that happiness, blessing, joy comes from justification by faith. Why? What is so good about justification by faith? Why is justification by faith the key to joy? Well, have a look at verse 11. What does he say? Pick it up halfway, half, halfway through. So then, he, Abraham, is the father of all who believe, but have not been circumcised, in order that righteousness might be credited to them. He is then also the father of the circumcised, who are not only are circumcised, but who also follow in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. You notice this. Catch it here if you can. Abraham is our father. We are in his family. Justification by faith is the key to joy in life because it makes us part of the family of God. This is what we're going to be looking at in a couple of weeks' time, is adoption. Justification brings faith because it leads to adoption into God's family. Abraham is our father. We are in the family of Abraham, the kingdom of God. Justification by faith brings you into his family by walking in his footsteps. The outsider becomes the insider, the outcast becomes the child, the lonely comes home. See, the materialist is wrong to think that joy will come through possessions and the workaholic is wrong to think that it comes through status or money. The religious person is wrong to think they'll find it by securing God's blessing through their works because that's always very precarious. Instead, blessing, joy, happiness, that lasts and can be certain is the free gift of justification by faith, because by justification by faith, you know God with an unbreakable bond. Justification by faith means that we can call Abraham our father and we live in the family of the people of God. Now, I, wonder what you, I wonder what you think, what's the, what's the best thing gonna be about new creation? I mean, it's hard to imagine, isn't it? What's the, the wonder of not sinning anymore and not wanting to sin anymore? Don't you long for that? That'd be great, won't it? That'd be brilliant. I don't think that's the best thing. I, it's going to be brilliant not to grieve again. We're, we're not going to lose anybody again, are we? We're no longer going to be in pain. We're no longer going to be suffering. Um, we're also going to be uh, seeing and knowing God face to face, aren't we? But I, I wonder if to capture that, what does it mean to see God face to face and, and, and the blessing of that? I think really perhaps the word that captures it best is that we will finally be home. Don't you think? You know, that the, the best thing, the thing that when we, we taste it brings us the most joy is that when we arrive there, we will know finally without any doubt or out any contradiction, we're home. We don't wanna be anywhere else. We don't wanna go anywhere else. We don't wanna leave. We are where we 
longed to be and now belong in Abraham's family. God is our Father, Christ is our Savior, the Spirit bringing joy and power and glory forever and ever and ever, and you won't want to be anywhere else. And justification by faith is what will get you there.